when the snow came off. I wanted to see how far we could move our sidewalk. And we got it pretty close. I, I was actually praying that all the snow would come off on Friday or Saturday because if it came off today, we probably would have had to dig a few vehicles out. And uh, <clears throat> so it did come off, and I was very thankful for the snowblower because there's a lot of snow on that roof. So anyway, good to have you here. Here we are, 2022. I guess this is the second Sunday, but this feels like the first Sunday of the new year just because of how the last one fell. And uh, I kind of have to chuckle. Um, growing up in the 70s, 80s, there was a lot of movies that were made during that time period that portrayed today, like where we're living right now. Uh, go back and watch Terminator and Back to the Future and some of those. They were all set in this time period, right? And I laugh and I go, well, we're not quite there yet, but... Maybe we could be on our way. And uh, <clears throat> I remember in the, in the 80s, would have been in the 80s, we were in Conrad, and I remember going to Sunday evening services as a kid and hearing that the whole world could collapse before I was a teenager. And I remember when they started using barcodes on checks and scanners in grocery stores, and my Sunday school, Sunday, school, Sunday school teacher just knew that those two things were the mark of the beast, and the end days were upon us. You know, as I thought about that yesterday, I, I had a thought, because of, because of where we are and what we're doing, and just kind of how we're growing together, and, and here's the thought. Um, isn't it a shame that that's all I remember of my Sunday school teacher? What wasted time and seed in the impressionable soil of a young person's life? What if she could have told me about the greatness of my Lord that overcame death, hell, the grave, and even the end times? Um, what if she had given the seed of God's nearness and life in my everyday life, rather than the fear of God's nearness to destroy the current age. There's a verse in 2 Timothy, it's actually pretty appropriate because it's verse 22, and I just, I always like, kind of like numbers, and I'm like, oh, this year we're going to have like a 2 2 and a 2 22 right? We're going to get those, but, uh, and actually, so I was watching, have you ever seen the movie Miracle? Miracle about the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team, and that game happened on the 22nd of February. I, I don't, anyway, it doesn't have anything to do with anything, but <clears throat> it was a very good movie. 2 Timothy 2.22, Paul tells Timothy, he says, have nothing to do with foolish speculations because they only cause arguments, which causes me to think of what Jesus told his disciples about the last days. This is all going someplace, believe it or not. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. I always, always think of this. Jesus told his disciples, but that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. And so now 40 years later, right, I look back on this conversations I had with my Sunday school teacher, and I have to say that Jesus was right. She didn't know. She didn't know. Yet that's what she sowed in my life in discipleship was seed that couldn't bear fruit for the kingdom. Mm. Right? What if she had sown seed that was appropriate in things we do know about that are for every day that bear fruit for the kingdom? We're getting ready to talk about discipleship. Getting ready to talk about discipleship, which is the fifth part of the mission of the church. It's the fifth function. It's the one that we haven't got to in our, our dream of statements. And uh, so I've kind of used that to set the tone for how are we using the influence that we have in the lives of the people around us? In the days that we live in, 
it is very easy to talk about speculation. But if the Lord tarries 40 years from now, will the things that I say today bear fruit 40 years from now? Right? Because the things that my Sunday school teacher was so sure of did not bear fruit. And here I am 40 years later. Now, is it her fault that I turned out the way I did? No, it is not. I'm just saying <laughs> that we have influence. And James told us that in the tongue, there is the power of life and death. And it's like, God, in my, it is, it is listen, I get, I get wound up too. And it is so easy to talk about what I'm wound up about. But what I'm realizing as I interact with my neighbors and with you guys and other people is like what people told me 40 years ago did impact my life. And what I say today will impact somebody 40 years down the road. I want to sow the seeds. I don't want to sow speculation. I want to sow the things that are sure, right? And God's nearness is sure today. And he has overcome death, hell, and the grave. And he will overcome anything that shows up today, tomorrow, or the next day. Doesn't matter what it is. And that's hope. And I want to sow that because that's what discipleship is. So I want to look at the, the fifth I dream of a church where and we, we started all of this just discovering the mission of, of the church. This is part of the mission of the, like the big C, big church, church that Jesus said, this is my church that I'll establish and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're a part of that church. We're a member of that church. We have a function in that church. But there's a big mission. This is part of the big mission. And the, the five functions of the big mission were to, anybody remember? Fellowship, worship, serve, evangelize, and discipleship. And we're at discipleship. And so we have this statement, I dream of a church where discipleship is. And another word for discipleship is grow, right? Discipleship is helping people to grow, helping, helping us to grow. And so let's take a look at this. Um, and, and here's the question again. I, I, I kind of set the tone for this, but it has to do with discipleship. How am I using my influence in the lives of those who are responding to God's call to transformation? Right? How am I using my influence in the lives of those who are responding to God's call to transformation? Um, I, I have a lot to say on discipleship. Um, of the five functions of the mission of the church, which are again fellowship, worship, serving, evangelizing, and discipleship, discipleship, in my opinion, is the most watered down. It's the most watered down. I want to talk about a little bit today about why I believe that to be true. All right? So, and uh, the reason that I believe it has come to that state is because of the five functions of the mission of the church, it requires the most of those who will be brave enough to love God with all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their strength. Discipleship requires the most of us. Um, and Because it, it is such unique in its relational dynamic. Now, it, it, if you take all of these functions, right, it is so interesting. If you talk about if you if you if you pull out worship and you look at worship, worship touches all of the five functions. If you pull out discipleship, discipleship touches all of the five functions. Um, if you pull out serving, serving touches all of the four functions. Nothing is standalone and independent. They all work together. But discipleship is very unique in the relational dynamic that it holds. And I wanna I wanna look at that a little bit today. Discipleship is a catalyst. Everybody say catalyst. You know what a catalyst is? Catalyst is an interesting thing. I thoroughly enjoyed chemistry when I, because I like fire. 
right? I like to burn things up. I like to blow things up. Um, I, my parents call it pyromania, but I, I just, when I got into high school and I get into chemistry, and so a catalyst, a catalyst is something that helps a reaction take place, right? And so if you were to go into oil refining, right, one of the major catalysts that they use to break oil into its parts and to, and to start this reaction, which includes a lot of heat, is nickel, right? They use a lot of nickel in the refining process of oil. Um, a catalyst, uh, I'm trying to think of another good cat. Well, you've all heard of a catalytic converter. You may even have had one stolen from underneath your car, okay? Platinum and there's some other metals that when unburned hydrocarbons enter into those, it starts a reaction which causes fire, burns those things up, and you end up with things that are less harmful to the environment. So that's a catalyst. So discipleship is a catalyst, right? Discipleship starts a reaction. Discipleship is a catalyst for the transformative work God has set himself to do in every life he reconciles to himself. So Jesus came, right, not just to forgive us of our sin. He forgave us of our sin so we could be reconciled to God. We could be brought back to him. And when that happens, God says, okay, now you have positioned yourself for the work that I want to do. And I want to transform you. And discipleship is the catalyst, right, that allows this transformation to happen. Now, it's, of course, under the auspices of the Holy Spirit in his working. He's at work in this. But discipleship is the catalyst that God has chosen. Everybody say chosen. Okay. How many of you understand that if God wanted to do it differently, he could? When I, when I say the word discipleship, it, it is God is right at the center of discipleship. And God, God could have done it any way he wanted. He could have snapped his fingers and you could be transformed. He could have blown your nose on you and you could have been transformed he could have said, you know, once you get baptized, that's it, all the work's done. But he didn't. He said, I have chosen discipleship. I have chosen people walking with people, which means that's the way he's going to do it. Because I have heard, maybe you've heard this too, right? I can do this by myself. No, you cannot. Well, God's big enough. Yes, he is, but that is not the method that he has chosen. And God is not yes and no. He said, this is the way I'm going to do it. This is the way he's going to do it. Right? Right. So discipleship is at the center, right, of the transformative work that God wants to do because that's what he's chosen. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that God lost his power and, 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 and you can't fall more in love with discipleship than you are in God, but God is in the midst of discipleship and what he's doing. All right. So, um. Let's see what the I dream of statement says. Here it is. I dream of a church where discipleship or growing is the reason we show up. Jesus' command and the privilege we embrace. Discipleship is a privilege. It's not a have to. It's a privilege. The heritage that goes beyond us and empowers those who carry the legacy of God's church. A systematic, reproducible stewarding of God's harvest. Man, I, I love that heritage that goes beyond us, right? Because that's what I talked about today, opening services. Really, what we sow is what goes beyond us. And I want to sow the best seed that I can sow. I want to sow the best seed that I can sow. Our, our, our vision statement, you know, and, and, and it, if you don't get all this, it's okay, because like it's taken me 20 years to, to get to a place where some of this starts to make sense, but the, the mission is what we're all about, and like our, our mission of this church is to create community in our community. It's so exciting. I've gotten to share that with some people this week. It's like, here's what we want ministry to look like, is we want to create some community with people. That's important. Important. Um, and so how we're going to do that, like the vision statement is harmonizing together in God's service, looking forward, 
creating a greater capacity for God. Discipleship looks forward. Discipleship looks forward. Um, man, I get stuck in today. Anybody else get stuck in today? Like what's in front of me screams, hey, uh, you know, pay attention. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to look over that and look forward. But discipleship is a forward looking and sometimes, most of the time, we have to remember that when we do it. What I'm doing is not merely for the moment. What I'm doing is I'm looking ahead and I'm sowing seed that will produce far beyond me. Right? That's discipleship. So, we just finished up evangelism. I dream of a church where evangelism is. And I want to really differentiate because even as I prepared for this, I went, I, I feel like I'm saying some of the same things I said over here. So I want to I want to kind of differentiate and draw a couple of things because both of these are unique. Evangelism and discipleship are unique in the purpose of the mission of the church. And I don't want them to just somehow kind of bleed together and become one because they are very distinct in their purpose. Evangelism is the work of every follower of Christ. What is that? It, it just is because it is the declaration of the good news that we've been given. And, and that doesn't mean that everybody's on a soapbox on the corner, but it means in my living, um, I share the good news. Right? That, that's, that's being an evangelist, and evangelism is going to look different in Val's life than it does in Willie's life, than it does in Joey's life, than it does in Scott's life. It's going to look different, but that's okay, right? Because we are all members of a body, right? We all function a little differently, but all of us have been given this evangelism as a lifestyle, Okay. So it is the work of every follower of Christ. We are to declare the good news in the way we listen, speak, and act every day, not just on Sunday. Every day. Every day. Evangelism at its base only requires one follower of Christ and the Holy Spirit to have it. That's what is required for evangelism is you and the Holy Spirit. Right? right? You don't have to have a crowd. No, you can have a crowd. You can do this as a group. There's nothing wrong with that. But so many times, um, <clears throat> I was most motivated to help somebody hear the good news on Sunday. Right? Right? I mean, that's what, I got to get them to church. I got to hey, get them to church. It's not a bad thing. But listen, the good news isn't just for Sunday. It's for every day. And so we have the ability to do that. But so one person, and I always remember that, uh, I remember when I was, you know, in Billings and I'm working as a mechanic and I would go to work and there was this old grumpy guy named Mel. And every day I walked by him and he would just grumble and the Holy Spirit began to deal with me. He goes, every day I want you to look him in the eye. I want you to smile. And I want you to say, good morning, Mel. And I'm like, boy, I don't know. He might bite me. I, he's grumpy, that guy. They called him the sauerkraut because he was an old German, cranky old guy. So I'd walk in. He'd be standing there at his lathe. Good morning, Mel. What's so good about it? <laughs> and I'd walk off, keep going. But he began to soften, and the Holy Spirit began to tell me, he goes, an outward smile is a sign of an inward work. What he was telling me is, give him the good news with an unrelenting smile and a hello. What's so good about it? I knew that God was good. He needed to know that God was good. And uh, I wasn't going to be deterred, and it actually kind of became a game. I, I, I The poor guy, I don't even know why he put up with me. He would, we would all gather around. You remember the, 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 the wash fountains? I don't know if you were ever in an old shop, or even in high school. We had these in high school. You would step on the bar, and the water would come out. And you could wash your hands there. like it was. So we had one of these big ones in the machine shop there. And so we'd all gather around on Friday, you know, and everybody's washing their hands and getting out. And I'd pull up next to Mel. I'm washing my hands. Mel, it's Friday. Yeah, he says it's Friday. I said, just think, only two more days till Monday. <laughs> Shut up, he said. <laughs> that was not good news. So 
Anyway, evangelism, one person in the Holy Spirit. We all do the work of an evangelist. And discipleship, on the other hand, requires two people who are followers of Christ or pursuing Christ. I would even go so far as to just say adherence to Christ. They're looking for him. They want what he has. It takes two of those people who are willing to submit to the working of the Holy Spirit. Discipleship cannot happen with just one follower of Christ. And discipleship, what we're going to learn, cannot happen unless you are a follower of Christ. Right? And we're, we're going to, I, I want to see this. I really want to frame discipleship up, maybe a little different than we've ever thought about it. It's kind of exciting, but discipleship is one of those things that God gave the church to show the world who he is. Jesus told us, we're going to get to it a little later, but he said, how did Jesus say that they would know them? By their love for one another. He was talking about discipleship. He's talking about discipleship. We're going to see all kinds of verses in the Bible that I've never associated with discipleship, but let me tell you this. Anytime you see a teaching verse that has to do with two followers of Christ, the element of discipleship is at work. Right? The element of discipleship is at work. All right. So, discipleship requires two. If you have ever wondered why the devil and his posse like to isolate followers of Christ, this is the number one reason. Because when two or more are gathered in discipleship, God's in their midst. God's in their midst. And if, you know, you know and, and you've heard it, I don't, I don't even remember what I said, and I think I started out to say this, but I've you just encounter people and they go, well, I can do this by myself. No, you cannot. Well, God's big enough. Yes, he is, but that is not what he has chosen and how he has chosen to grow his people. This is how he has chosen to grow his people. And that's, there seems to be a bit of confusion on that because we play, well, you know, God's big enough. Yes, he is, but what did he say? Because he meant what he said and he said what he meant. Right? So, discipleship, big deal to God. Big deal to God. Um, I put here a pretty bold statement. We will never become the transformed children of God we are intended to be if we are not willing to engage in the act of discipleship. Why? Because that is the vehicle that God has chosen for transformation. Now, can we do discipleship without the Holy Spirit? Nope, you cannot. He's the driver, <laughs> right? He's the driver. Yeah, you can't do any of this without the Holy Spirit. And no joke, every day when we get up, I, I man, I tell you, I don't do it every day. Your pastor's learning and growing. Holy Spirit, baptize me again. You know what? If we all started praying that in the new year every day, by the end of this year, we would look different. Why? Because it's his power, right, that enables us to do the things that need to be done. Without him, we can do nothing. And, and just to start out with that statement of reliance, Holy Spirit, I need you to saturate me again today, right? It's not a statement of, oh, I messed it up so bad, or I got so many holes that all leaked out. It's just the picture of, right, the word Baptized, that's used is the word saturate, and it's the picture of a rag being put into a liquid and coming out with every fiber saturated. But what naturally should happen to a rag when you saturate it? It should drip and leak, and it will naturally dry out because it gives. Right? And so every day to say, oh, saturate me again. Saturate me again. Saturate me again. Fill me with your presence and your purpose and your power so that I can do the things that you've created me to do. Um, discipleship is no different. We will never 
become the transformed children of God that we are intended to be, we might get to a spot, but it's certainly not the spot that God intended us to stop. The point that you resist God is the point where you stop. Right? Right? It is. The point where you resist God is the point where you stop. Not because God's not big enough to move you, but because he said that he wouldn't. He said, I desire a willing heart and an obedient life. That's my desire. And so I earnestly wait for you. Isaiah 30, I, I read it and I read it and I read it. And it's God calling out to his children and saying, I long to be gracious to you, but you would have none of it. Therefore, and he goes on to tell them what's going to happen. And it's absolutely ridiculous what's going to happen. But that's exactly what happened. Um, and so rather than stiff arming God at any point in my life, when I start out every day and I say, God, saturate me again, right? I'm inviting him to come. And God, if I'm stiff arming you someplace, please show me. Because sometimes I do it without realizing I'm doing it. I've just done it for so long. I think it's a part of life. And he goes, no, let me show you where you stopped the process. And you've just been surviving now, and I want you to thrive. Let me take you to where you thrive. All right. So um, let's take a few minutes and consider what discipleship is. What discipleship is. Um, discipleship is two or more, and I, and I took it down to adherence. You know that every year we do a report on this church. We send it in to our state office, and it goes to the national office. It's called an ACMR. I, I don't even know what it stands for, annual church something. And uh, we, we just report, uh, um, you know, how many people come to the church, how many people are members of the church, and they ask the question, how many people are adherents of the church? Now, an adherent is a person who comes. They've never really become a member of the church, which is, is a whole other message that I give every once in a while, why that is so important. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of, yes, this is my place I want to commit here. We won't go there, but it, 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 it is. So they say, well, how many adherents do you have? You know, an adherent is someone, they've never taken that step, but they're here, right? They're here, and we go, well, we've got this many adherents. And, and I believe uh, there are different levels of commitment inside of every church. And, and an adherent is just someone says, well, this is, this is my home. You know, I believe in God, but I just got a lot of questions. It's an adherent, right? So let's, let's take it clear down to the adherent. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it's the basement level, but I kind of wanted to explain it before I started using that term. So discipleship is two or more adherents growing together I said growing, not just hanging out. Growing together in the grips of God's love, which releases us to experience transformative living. Now, I, gotta, I always got to go back to the picture, right? I, when I say discipleship, I have a picture. So do you. I don't, I don't know what your picture is, but my picture, the picture I have held when I hear the word discipleship, is that of a classroom. You have a teacher and you have a student. Information passes from the teacher to the student. The student leaves with the expectation of implementing the information in a proper way. And then the student becomes more mature as they practice the information. Okay, that's when I think of discipleship, I maybe simplified it enough to where I, I could just say that, but that is the basic picture, is the transformation of information when I think of discipleship. And that is part of discipleship, but it is not the whole of discipleship. And so in, in my picture, um, at the end of the day, discipleship boiled down to imparting a belief system. That's, you know, when I thought of discipleship, that's what I thought of is the imparting of a belief system. Uh, you have a more mature person and you have someone 
that's growing and learning. And so discipleship was the passing of information from one person to the next. That is a part of discipleship. It is a part of it. But it is not the whole of it. The interesting thing about what I just shared is that it's only half the picture. The belief system must be given. However, the power of the belief system becomes real. How many of you know a belief system's got to become real? It's not enough to just have a belief system. The belief system becomes real when we get to see what it looks like in the life of another as we interact in our daily living. The other interesting dynamic of discipleship is that the roles of student and teacher can shift as we allow the Holy Spirit to lead this group. And so in discipleship, my picture is you've always got a mature person leading another, but the real picture of discipleship is there is a belief system that is given. But the belief system becomes real when I watch you live it out. Right? Um, I've got a book, really good book, called The Other Half of the Church. And this gentleman, he was not a follower of Christ. And when he got into college, he had a Christian roommate. And they were sitting talking one night. And this guy was going to go out for the weekend, and he was going to find the first cute thing he could, and he was going to do what the world does when those things happen. And he was talking to his roommate about that, and, and his roommate goes, no, we don't do that. What? What are you talking about? He goes, no, here's, here's what the Word of God says. Here's how we're to treat. Here's how we're to respect. Uh, sex is God's gift to the marriage bed, Right? And he showed him all these things, and he looked around, and he began to see a group of people who were living this out. And he said, that's where I learned the belief system was true. I watched it lived out, and I watched the dynamic and the health that was in the relationships of those people compared to what I had. And he said, I understood then it was real. Not just because they gave me the information, but because they lived it out. They lived it out, right? And that's what discipleship. Is about, and that's why it takes two people. That's where it differs from evangelism. Even Jesus said, when he gave the good news, he said, they're just some people that aren't going to take it. Right? But in discipleship, you have two people that desire to grow, having the information, embracing the information, but watching it lived out in the lives of one another as we spend time together. And so you have this proximity of closeness that's a part of discipleship, which makes it unique. It's two people growing together. And that's the other thing. When you go, well, who can I get in a discipleship relationship with? Because if you're like me, I'm always looking for somebody that's ahead of me, right? I want them to teach me. But really, discipleship, the roles can change. The roles can change. And the person that knows little all of a sudden is teaching the one who knows more. And I watched this happen with my kids so many times. They, I said, God taught me more with my kids than I ever learned on my own, right? I mean, I would watch them, and, and all of a sudden, God would go, you know, that's how I feel about you. Ooh, good or bad, right? Hey, are you frustrated with that? How do you think I feel about this? <clears throat> oh, oh, God, you know? <clears throat> so uh, the roles can change. That's the neat thing about discipleship. That's why we just need to be in the relationships and let God decide which way the information needs to travel as we live it out, right? So, <clears throat> so I, I, and I, and I want to take this back. I really want you to see this, and this is kind of where we'll close it up and we'll pick it up next week. But another aspect of discipleship, so you have the impartation of a belief system that is being lived out. But an aspect of discipleship is that of taking on the nature of another. Now, when I talk about transformative living, you know, so many times I've made the excuse, well, that's just who I am, okay? But when I say that, I make God really small. He is able to transform anyone that's willing to be transformed. 
And when you're transformed, if you start out a caterpillar, you don't end up a prettier caterpillar. You end up a butterfly, right? God's, God's not putting paint jobs on rusty old buckets. He's transforming them. And, and it's not about who I am. It's about who he is and my willingness. And so discipleship, when discipleship happens, we begin to take on the character of another. We begin to take on because the Holy Spirit is the driver. And so it's going to be the character of Christ that he's going to begin to work in us as we walk together in discipleship. So in the days that Jesus lived, I want you to see this, because we get the word from someplace, right? Discipleship. So in the days that Jesus lived, people who were serious about being a Jew would look for a rabbi to follow. It's very interesting. I was talking to Lynn Lapka. He was sharing some of this with me. He goes, they, they would, he goes, that's why, you know, when you see the rabbi, he goes, you, you don't understand. They were very important people. They were people who were looked for by other people who were serious about doing this. Okay? Now, who does this bring to your mind? Who are, who do, who are the people that you would think of? Who are, who are the people that I would think of when I talk about people looking for a rabbi to follow? Oh, come on. How about Jesus and his 12 disciples? They constantly called him rabbi because he was. So his followers, right, that followed him, they were looking for a rabbi to follow. They were looking for somebody to follow. And when they did this, right, uh, and, and, and by the way, Later on, what did we call those 12? Disciple, 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 discipleship, disciple, discipleship. So discipleship is what a rabbi did. Discipleship is what Jesus did with his 12 disciples. And so when you consider, if you want a good picture of discipleship, look at the relationship that Jesus had with his disciples because this was very common for a rabbi to have this type of relationship with those who followed him. That's why they were there, okay? Anyone who attached himself to a rabbi was not there to simply have Torah lessons. They were there to live the way the rabbi lived, to take on his nature and manner of doing life. That was a part of discipleship and that was a part of what it meant to be called a disciple. A disciple did not want a belief system. They wanted a whole life transformation through their interaction with their rabbi. A disciple wanted a new character and nature. So interesting that lots of people came and heard the information that Jesus gave out freely, right? Sermon on the Mount. Could have been up to 20,000 people, women and children. There's, a, there's another where they figured there was 12,000. So people were flocking to hear Christ. Okay, what do we call that? It wasn't discipleship. What was it? It was evangelism. It was evangelism. He's sharing the good news. And guess what? A lot of them went home and never came back, right? And Jesus even asked those who were following him at one point, hey, do you guys want to leave too? <laughs> Have I offended you? And, and they said, no. You know, Peter, who else shall we go? For you have the words of life, of life. Now, you don't call them the words of life if they're just a belief system. You only call them the words of life if they're changing you, Right? Right? That's what made them life. And so Jesus evangelized all those people, but only 12 walked with him every day as they heard the information, and Jesus called those 12 his disciples. Discipleship looks like something. Discipleship is very personal and relational. 
And discipleship is not just the impartation of a belief system. There's a belief system in place, and the Holy Spirit is working in that, but he's not using it to help us feel better about our belief system. He uses that in relationship to help us see our need for transformation. Because if you want to know how transformed you need to be, get in relationship with some people. How many of you work, right? How many of you have coworkers? How many of you go to Walmart? How many of you, wherever, and, and, but, but even closer than that, you know, the people that live next door or whatever, and you, and, you, and you know other believers of Christ, and you begin to walk with them, because I'm not just talking about anybody, right? Discipleship requires people who want the information, <laughs> right? And so somebody goes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm taking hold. I want God to change my life. All right, let's, let's walk together. Let's walk together, and and you watch me, and I'll watch you, and let's share, and we're going to rub on each other, and that's part of discipleship, right? But it's okay, because what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit is going to use that to transform our lives. He's going to use that to transform our lives. He's going to help us to see our weaknesses. He's going to help us to encourage one another, and we're going to take what we have heard and we're going to live it out together. That's discipleship. That's a great place to stop. I, uh, we're going to pick up, we're going to fast forward 2,000 years, and we're going to talk a little bit about what brain science is learning that Jesus already knew when he taught about discipleship and how important it is in the life of a church. Um, it is so important, I just say, it's so important the relationships that we have outside of here. I look my best on Sunday, not just because my wife dresses well. That's just what we do, isn't it? We look our best on Sunday. How you doing? Doing, doing good, doing good. <laughs> Didn't tell you that. I kicked the dog on the way out of the house, and threw a snowball at the neighbor that speeds down the street constantly. Didn't tell you about all those things. But if you live close enough to me and you pay attention, you go, man, look like you had a rough week. <sighs> I did. I did. I did. I don't, you, how are you going to handle that next time? <sighs> I don't know. i just been frustrated. You know, I... I had somebody like that one time, and I did this, and the Lord spoke into my life, and here's what I began to pray. I'll bet if we prayed that together, I'll bet you God will meet you there. Hmm. You got to have those relationships. It is so important. Discipleship requires more of us than any other of the five functions, right? I can worship without you. Sometimes. I can evangelize without you. Sometimes. I can serve without you. Most times. I can't fellowship without you. That does require two. But I would say fellowship and discipleship walk hand in hand. So much. So much. Um, but fellowship is an element that doesn't necessarily require two believers. Right? Discipleship is very unique in that God gave this gift to the church to bring the transformation that needs to happen in our lives because he chose it to happen that way. Not because he couldn't have done it another way. It's just what he chose. It's what he chose. And I think that's why the devil works so hard to water it down because when the church has a belief system but we're not living as disciples, we're very ineffective. Very ineffective. And, and Jesus, you know, I'm just, I'm throwing this out there, priming the pump for next week. What was, what was the last thing Jesus told him? Go and make disciples. Now, I will tell you ahead of time, I'm going to blow the punchline, that we take that verse and we associate it with evangelism more than we do with discipleship. And that's not what Jesus said. He did not say go and make converts. 
Because a convert can live on a belief system. He said, go and make disciples. And disciples requires to believe. And then John tells us that Jesus said, and they will know you by your love for one another. So that discipleship is so strongly tied to evangelism that it shows we can't do it by ourselves. We do need one another, but it's all of our responsibility. All right. Amen. Father, we thank you. Uh, God help us. It's, it's a lot of work to be in relationship with other followers of Christ because we're all a little different. We all, we all, we all, we all run life just a little bit different. And uh, God, it can be tough, but you, you love discipleship. And God, it is the way that we pass on the power and the heritage of the church. Because when we live life together, encouraging one another, sharpening one another, challenging one another, being honest with one another, praying for one another, God, all elements of discipleship. We thank you for it. Holy Spirit, would you challenge us this week in that as we maybe just have a, a thought of somebody, we go, man, I just, I just know I need to connect with them. God, that we would just take that step. Just take the step. We don't have to figure out how it's all going to work, God. We just trust you and take the step because that's all you ask us to do is to live in childlike faith and respond one day at a time, one choice at a time in honoring you. God, would you help us to grow um, and to mature and to become stronger than we've ever been in this element of discipleship? We thank you for all these things. Uh, would you remind us, Holy Spirit, help us to ponder that question. How are we using the influence that you've given us in the lives of those around us that we can walk with in discipleship? I want to say that, other believers. How are we encouraging one another? as long as it's called today. Father, we thank you for that. Go with us this week. And uh, God, we just, uh, again, pray for all those who are, are sick and uh, just facing um, some difficult situations uh, during this time and this season. Would you strengthen them? Would you encourage them? God, we pray that they would know you as their I am uh, today and tomorrow and through this week. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.